Today we are going to be visiting the old age debate of ISO versus dynamic range with pretty much all cinema cameras, but specifically this video is catered to ISO versus dynamic range on the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K. This debate about ISO versus dynamic range is only applicable to people that own cinema cameras that can shoot in RAW. Some cinematographers, they'll just be like, oh yeah, I'm just gonna shoot somewhere between 100 and 1000 because it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, the ISO is just metadata when it comes to RAW anyways, and we can change it in DaVinci and, and it'll be fine. Just, I'm gonna shoot whatever looks better. But if you're working with an actual crew, meaning you have a whole gaffer team, you have a grip team, you need to know going in ahead of time what ISO you're gonna be shooting at. Otherwise, the gaffer is not going to be able to help you. If you just say, because he's gonna to come to you and say, hey, what ISO are we shooting at? And you say, uh, I don't know, somewhere between 100 and 1,000, the gaffer is gonna look at you like you're nuts because he needs to know because he's the one walking around with the light meter. So it is super beneficial to know this stuff ahead of time. And then another uh, DP responded to me with a very awesome article from the ASC. If you don't know what the ASC is, that is the American Society of Cinematographers, right? And this was a post on their Instagram that came out a year ago. This advice only applies to RAW, right? So like I said in the beginning of the video, this is only for cinema cameras that can shoot in RAW. In RAW, you have to think about ISO backwards. In a brightly lit scene, you want to shoot a higher ISO. In a low light scene, you want to shoot a lower ISO. This makes sense because with the my first encounter with the dual native ISO of the Pocket 4K, um, when I was doing those low light tests, I noticed that when I went into Resolve, if I was in the second tier, meaning 1250 and up, I was stuck in that tier under the raw clip uh, metadata. Meaning once you capture something in 1250 or above in the second tier, you can't change that to 400 because that's a whole nother tier. So 1250, once you're in that tier, that's the lowest you can go. And after reading that article from ASC, that makes sense why 1250 looks the best in my low light tests, because 1250 is the lowest you can go. In the low light test, you can see where the shadows really are preserved, because I start playing around with this, right? And in the low light test, I recorded the same exposure, same set, at 400, 1,000, 1,250, and 3,200, right? And obviously the 1,000 looks the worst, just looks like garbage. And the 400 is pretty, pretty dark. And then when we jump to 1,250, it looks very clean. But then also I record at the second dual native ISO, which is 3,200. Now here's where the interesting thing comes into play, because people say it doesn't matter, you can change the ISO and resolve, it doesn't matter. But here's where it does matter, because you are affecting what dynamic range is captured on the day. You can't get the dynamic range back, right? And it's been clearly defined for me in this little test. Because if you watch here on this little test, I captured this image in 3200, right? And when I changed it to 1250, the shadows are gone. They're just gone. But if you look at the clip where it's actually captured in 1250, the shadows are there, they remain even when you jump higher or lower, or you can't go any lower than 1250, but even when you jump higher, they remain. That shadow on that back wall is still there. But when you go to the clip that was originally captured in 3200, and you drop it down to 1250, it didn't make a difference. Those shadows are gone, the shadow on that back wall. So right away, not only, and plus to me, the 1250 is just cleaner. If you shoot at 3200 ISO, you can clearly see here in this example that those shadows are gone. You can't get those back. Even if you know you took that clip and even if you change it down to 1250, those shadows are still gone. So it is interesting to see like, yeah, you probably wanna live at 1250 when shooting in low light because that's the lowest you can go in that second tier. Now people would say, Justin, why don't you just live at 400? Because that's really the lowest you can go or even 100. But as you'll see in these tests, the 400 is noisy. The 400 is noisy when compared to the 1250, in my opinion. The 1250 is cleaner, has better colors. Um, so yeah, me going forward, I know now when shooting the Pocket 4K, I'm going to shoot all my low light stuff at 1250. And I'm definitely staying away from the 3200 because, you know, I'm losing the shadows. Now the hard part was, for me, the highlight test. And I say that because I live in LA. 
it's very hard, you know, normally to get great uh, test examples of this, you'd want to shoot at a, a brightly lit exterior scene with some great clouds in the deep landscape. That's really how you can test if you're preserving those highlights because of the clouds. However, in LA, there's barely ever clouds because of all the smog and pollution. You only see those clouds directly after, you know, a morning directly after it rains. So it was a little hard for me to test this. However, we can still see some interesting things. Now with the outdoors, I just stuck to 400 versus 1000 because that was primarily what I was interested in. I didn't want to go into that second tier when shooting outdoors uh, because I think that would be not beneficial in the same way that shooting in the first tier is at in the low light situation. That is one of the benefits and the advantages of the dual native ISO system where you're essentially, as another YouTuber said, you're creating it's almost like having two cameras in one. So when outdoors, I just stuck to the first tier, 400 versus uh, versus 1,000, right? That first tier. But the interesting thing started happening when I got on the on the clip that was recorded in 1,000 ISO, and I started and I dropped it down to 400, and we actually preserved those highlights. As you'll see in this example here, the highlights were preserved much better than in the 400 ISO captured setting, right? You can see on the RGB parade there where the highlights are preserved. They're not as peaking high up as they were on the clip that was captured in 400. So you are preserving those highlights when shooting in 1000. And then if you get in post and you want to drop it down to 400, it's looking, the highlights are being preserved better than they were when it was originally caught in 400 ISO. <sighs> Holy crap, that is one hell of a, ra of a rabbit hole. A very interesting find, especially with the outside stuff. That goes against everything I've ever been taught and learned. You know, you wanna, you wanna shoot it low, right? I, I would always go out and shoot at the 400 ISO. I would never dream of putting that at 1,000. It's just so interesting. But you don't really see the differences until you get into Resolve and start looking and dissecting and picking apart you know, under that uh, camera raw tab, you know, and you can really start digging around in there and really seeing like, oh, the 1000 ISO is preserving these highlights. And you don't know it until you drop that clip down to 400 ISO and you compare it to the clip that was captured in 400 ISO. And then you can start to see the differences there. And the same for the low light. The low light was way more obvious because we actually had shadows and things that we could see that were just disappearing at the higher ISO. My conclusion is I think all day exteriors, I think maybe I will live at a thousand ISO to preserve those highlights. For all super low light situations, I think I'm gonna live at 1250 to preserve my shadows. And for everything else where I am in 100% complete control of the lighting, I think I'm just gonna stick to the good old 400 native ISO. Because also if you look there on the Blackmagic design raw dynamic range chart, you can see Essentially, that chart is telling us no matter where you go, it's you are still getting the same stops of dynamic range, right? And the only time that you're actually losing dynamic range is when you go beyond that 8,000. And there you can see on the chart, it drops. It just, it just plummets. It drops down. That's just me. I don't know. Leave your, uh, your thoughts and comments down below. Let me know what you guys think about it. I know this is a long heated debate, but very interesting stuff. If you're interested in any of my filmmaking gear as an independent filmmaker, check out my kit bag down in the description below. All the gear I use is in there. And for now, that's a wrap.